Welcome back to Echo Ridge, where we have an upcoming emergency, and that has to do with carbon dioxide. As you can see, our levels are getting pretty high. Over on the gas overlay, things look even worse. Now, as bad as this is, I don't consider this an emergency. This is just a regular old Monday here on Echo Ridge Gaming. The emergency has to do with our carbon dioxide system that we've been using for the past hundred cycles, and that was just let it all drop here and freeze. If we look around here, we can see there's 25 kilos of liquid carbon dioxide here, 25 here. Up here, there's some more liquid carbon dioxide. And unfortunately, carbon dioxide turns back into a gas at minus 48. Except the way oxygen not included does these sort of conversions, if they have a little buffer temperature, this liquid carbon dioxide here is at minus 47 and still a liquid. But what's happening is it's flashing and then turning right back into a liquid. Now, that's not gonna last for very much longer. And when it all does flash back into a gas is where I'm saying we're gonna have a huge problem because it's gonna push the carbon dioxide level higher and higher. So task one today is going to be building a carbon skimmer. We're also gonna be renovating this area. I'd like to get a new nicer barracks in here along with the new pip and arbitrary ranch and our nature reserve. And the reason why we're using this area is because of all the dirt. We'd like to naturally plant these trees as much as possible so we don't have to pay the polluted water cost. And if we look at our levels here, we have one level here that is going to end up having plenty of natural flooring. The same goes with here, except not nearly as much. And then finally, our original barracks probably has the most amount of natural tiles remaining. But wouldn't it even be better if we can combine that renovation to where they're guaranteed to go through the nature reserve every single day? Yes, yes it would. So let me get all this cleaned up and get the levels in and we'll go from there. Dear Echo, when you drain the water tank with all the water, can we please also move the bleach stone storage? Thanks. This will be much better here. And I'm also hoping that the dupes are going to be able to load up the bleach stone without coming down this far on the ladder but we'll see. Another problem we're having is this vent is slowly dropping off more and more water, as pretty much designed. It's all coming from the desalinator. Except because there's a tile worth of carbon dioxide here, I'm worried that this vent will not shut off. I'm actually waiting to see if it does. If it doesn't, we're gonna have to put a tile in here and destroy the carbon dioxide, which we'll probably do eventually anyways, but I like doing these sort of experiments just to find out. And sadly, it looks like we're one tile too low for Eilart not to get wet when loading up the bleach stone. Now we could move this up, but then that would ruin my perfect levels here. So no, the dupes are just gonna have to deal with the sopping wet. I mean, stress is doing okay right now. I think we have a little bit of flex room. And I'm sorry, DK Oz, it is time for some renovations. So we're gonna have to remove your wonderful massage table. It makes sense that DK Oz is always the most stressed out because they do all the digging. So quite literally, they're always sort of in front of the action, not being able to breathe, getting wet, etc, etc. And there I go again with the back-to-back -back et cetera's. I did hear a great reason for the back-to-back -back et cetera's. It just means a little bit more of the et cetera. But at this point, it's bugging me so much, I'm just trying to say it once. Now we need to decide where we actually want the carbon skimmer. Because the carbon skimmer requires water, it sort of limits where we can put it. Because all of the regular water would end up freezing down here because it's below zero degrees. Not too big of a deal, we could just put it right inside this ranch, but then we're still going to have a bunch of carbon dioxide up here. Which then brings up bigger discussions on build strategy here on this colony. This is a very small planetoid, so what is our end goal with this? We know we're going to have another colony over on the other side of the teleporter, and being that we're going to be sending this into the late, late, late game, that planetoid is going to be fully colonized as well. Now, because we have uranium and bees here, it's going to give us access to nuclear power. But other than that, this colony doesn't have a lot of resources. I mean, only two water geysers, and then a carbon dioxide geyser and a carbon dioxide vent. Oh, thank you, Randy. In Verilin over here, which is our connected asteroid, isn't too much better, though. It only has a carbon dioxide vent, a liquid sulfur geyser, a hot polluted oxygen vent, and an infectious polluted oxygen vent. Oh, thanks again. The reason why I mention all that is because you typically want to decide where your long-term primary colony is going to be based on where your resources and your space program is going to be. And considering both of our starting planetoids are horrible at best, it doesn't give us a lot of reasons to sway one way or the other. In the end though, I think this is still going to be our primary colony. 
For one, the nuclear. But for two, we have the water here. And I can't believe I got into that huge conversation that all started with, where are we going to put a carbon skimmer? I'm not even sure how I ended up there. Probably when I was thinking about where this colony is going to start and sort of finish, in terms of where the duplicates live. But for now, this will be just fine as a location for the carbon skimmer. It's only 12 degrees here, and a little bit of heat will actually help warm this area up. And yes, we are still hurting on refined metals and, well, quite frankly, all metals. I mean, we're supposed to have metallic caves and geodes, but pretty much the only geode I've seen is this one here with the iron ore and diamond. And the only metallic cave I've seen is this one here with a little bit of cobalt. So, so much for some impactful world traits. Inverlin is supposed to be metal rich. Of course, that planetoid's not going to be very large either because it's the flipped asteroid. So I think the goal is going to have to be to get a great space program and mining all these wonderful asteroids. Now, water for this is going to be pretty easy. We're just going to come right off of our oxygen line. The polluted water is going to be just as easy, although it's going to require just a little bit longer of a run. I don't want to pay the cost for another water sieve. And it just so happens we already have one for the bathrooms. So just like when we we're draining the polluted water over here somewhere, we're just going to tie in with this water sieve. It's not going to interrupt the bathroom flow because all the sinks and the toilets have this sort of 50-50 split right here. And already our carbon skimmer is doing a great job. And when the water sieve cleans all that water, well, it's just going to head right back to the oxygen machine and the carbon skimmer line. It's pretty nice having the carbon skimmer pretty close to your bathroom for this reason. Of course, in all fairness, everything's pretty close on this planetoid. All right, we've gotten the levels fixed. Now it's a little bit easier to see what we have options to. The first thing we're going to move is the pip ranch. And because we're going to be wanting to naturally plant these arbor trees, we want an area that has a bunch of natural tiles. Now, why are we ranching pips? I don't have a great reason for you. Maybe it's the free lumber. Or maybe it's just the infinite supply of dirt. Yeah, that's what we're going to go with. It's the infinite supply of dirt. But remember, it only takes three wild planted arbor trees to support an entire ranch full of pips. So in order to get maximum branch growth, this space here would not work. Because we'd put one tree here, it would grow its branches this way. And then you'd put one tree here, and it would grow its branches this way. And then we'd have one tree here that would have sort of half the branches. So I think we're going to go with this second level because I've got big plans for that third level down there. Step one, we need to get it cleaned up, except we don't have any infinite storage yet. And it's by in time that we actually get it going. What is wrong with sulfur? Why are you hurting, little buddy? Oh, you're really stressed out. 66%? Oh, you're fine. The astute amongst you will notice that we are no longer getting the bonus for the barracks but at least everybody has a place to sleep. We've gone ahead and upgraded Majin Lord's skills, so now they have Masterworks Decorating. Their morale requirement's a little higher than we wanted, but I think the juice is gonna be worth the squeeze. We have a couple of large sculpting blocks going around to try to make what's soon gonna be our infinite storage area very nice. We're also gonna put a nice flower pot here, of course going with the sunny retro, and then one day I think we'll put a nice Masterworks painting here, if we ever find thimble reed. We have the wonderful automatic dispenser set, and unfortunately we don't have any seeds that we can plant. The minimum temperature for the mirth leaf seed is 20 to 50, and right now it's about 15 degrees here. So we're just gonna leave the sunny retro flower pot without a plant in it. I mean, it still looks nice. I mean, who doesn't want a pot full of dirt just hanging around their area? And since we finally have that storage, we're gonna do, well, a lot of sweeping. We haven't done a sweep like this since the colony started, so it's high in time we get rid of all that negative decor debris. Now, is this going to take a couple of cycles? Yes. Do we have anything better to do? Yes. But we're still going to do this anyways. It would be helpful if the duplicants had access to some of their improved carrying. So we're going to go through and do a quick skill update and give the dupes at least improved carry one where we can. Oh man. In the course of doing this, I just noticed that the queen is really not having a good time. They have a morale requirement of 9 and a current morale of 6. Part of the problem is they don't love to do ranching. They'd rather do the farming. But this was a necessity while we were trying to achieve carnivore. So I think step 1 is going to be skill scrubbing the queen. We're taking this break from our scheduled cleanup time and skill scrubbing Mr. DK Oz as well. They were also not having a good time of it because, well, they have a morale requirement of 13 and only a morale of 5. How is this happening? DK Oz had been eating barbecue for about 20-30 cycles. Now they're eating pickled meal. That's a net difference of 9, because the pickled meal gives you a minus 1 to morale, 
and the barbecue gives you a morale of plus eight. And unfortunately, they took a break from skill scrubbing to binge eat. That's not good. Oh yeah, just take it all in. Oh, this is only gonna end poorly. Wouldn't it be nice if Ani had the sort of RimWorld feature where we could sort of, you know, gently arrest DKRs and put them in a room? I mean, they literally got out of the skill scrubber to have that mental breakdown. Apparently, Sulfur is now at 100% stress, but luckily for us, they're only a vomiter. We're down to 30,000 calories. We were up at 60 to 70. I can't take another binge eating episode. So it might be time that we install a clinic where the duplicates can get a nice relaxing massage. Too late, sulfur stress vomiting. The good news though is it goes all the way down here where the polluted water is not gonna off gas because there's too much carbon dioxide and eventually it should just freeze. Ah, uh, that's more like it. Everybody take a load off. Everything's gonna be just fine. And what's even better, because we're in a massage clinic receiving the massage, we get the massage stress relief bonus, which is a minus 60% per cycle versus the minus 30% per cycle by just using this standard massage table. So a lot of the sweep commands have been completed and I don't know if I can tell a difference either. Obviously it is a little bit better because debris naturally just causes a minus to decor and a two tile radius. So when you have a spot like this, it becomes minus 50 pretty quick. Oh dear goodness. I've completely miscalculated where this carbon dioxide vent was going to be stifled. It is emitting 392.3 grams worth of 500 degree carbon dioxide. This is a big problem. And unfortunately the old temperature shift plate trick I don't think is going to work because the carbon dioxide doesn't hold enough heat to be able to turn a temperature shift plate. I didn't discover this until I saw this entire row was a little backed up on carbon dioxide. How am I gonna fix this while still maintaining our stable? I guess we can try the coal? and just hope it gets hot enough in here to flash that and, you know, not burn our dupes? I could have sworn it was this tile right here. Yeah, that temperature shift plate's only 33 degrees and falling quickly now that the carbon dioxide vent is idle. It'll erupt again in about a half a cycle, so maybe it'll be hot enough just for a quick second to flip the temperature shift plate from coal to refined carbon, but I'm not gonna get my hopes up. Yeah, this is not gonna work. <laughs> 34.6. 34.7. So our only other solution is to sort of just stifle it. Well, that's gonna have to do. Goodbye, carbon dioxide vent. I really need to remember the two over and two up. It's just sometimes when we're looking at these vents, it sort of throws you off because they're only two tiles wide. As for this issue, this stable is now only 93 tiles. You could deconstruct the door and the tile and just let them roam free, but then I'd need to add more auto sweepers and conveyor loaders and I just don't have the metal for that. So I think the simplest solution is we'll just reduce the maximum critters here to seven. Now let's see who's gonna be converted to meat faster than normal. Now it's time to work on moving the pip ranch over. Unfortunately, the pips are gonna need the trees to be growing before we transfer them. The reason why is if you transfer them before the arbor trees have branches, they'll end up starving to death before the branches start growing. Lucky for us, I have this one wild pip here. So we're going to use the wild pip to get all the arbitrary started. And then we're going to use the priority zero mod to make sure the dupes never end up building these ladders so we can direct the pip on exactly where to plant the trees. We're going to be one here, one here, one here, and then, uh, yeah, one more right here. And you may have noticed that we're sort of running low on calories. Well, gave up is trying to fix that right now. Yes, back to mush bars we go. The hatches are coming online, but they're still not quite there yet. And we only have enough mealwood for about five dupes. Although I suppose there is some more area here where we can throw in some mealwood. Look, I'm not proud of it either, but mush fry can't taste that bad, right? I mean, at a minimum, it's gotta be better than a McDonald's hash brown. Did you know when a cuddle pip actually hugs an incubator, it doesn't lullaby it, but rather it cuddles it? This means we're getting the 5% for it being incubating, 400% for it being lullabied, and 100% for it being cuddled. So this one stone hatch can go from brand new egg to hatched in just over three cycles. Our starvation issues are doing okay. We're up to 11,000 calories worth of pickled meal, thanks to the mush pie supplement. But there's almost 60 critters in this room, which means this should take over here shortly and provide us with nothing but barbecue. And I think the dupes will be thankful for that because they're all pretty much stressed out. Thankfully, the massage clinic keeps them all at 50% or lower. And I just realized 
all the extra mealwoods that we planted is going to get in the way of the pip being able to plant the arbor acorn. There we go. Now that the trees are planted, we can put our wonderful mealwoods back. Thank you, Pip. And it looks like we've earned another achievement, except I'm not 100% sure which one this is. They got better. Cure a sick duplicate of disease. Somebody must have gotten food poisoning and was cured by using one of the curative tablets. The last thing we need to do for the Pip Ranch is putting in some of our shipping. Unfortunately, we are running really low on cobalt and aluminum. Well, no big deal, Echo. Just grind up some more. Except, we're also running low on the ores, so I'm actually going to destroy a bunch of pneumatic doors. Now, this has come up a bunch, and normally I put two pneumatic doors on top of each other because it only cost 100 ore, versus an airflow tile that would end up costing you 200. Now, we do normally want all the gases to be free-flowing through these doors, but because we're hurting on so much metal, we're going to use normal tiles here. And, well, just about everywhere. And for all that door destroying, we received about two tons worth of aluminum ore. And we're going to feed it to this wonderful little smooth hatch. This will allow us to enjoy a 75% conversion versus the 50% by using the rock crusher. It's not much, but anything's better than what we have now. All right, we're up to 82,000 calories worth of pickled meal, which tells me the barbecue is now kicked in. So step one, we can get rid of this wonderful microbe musher that's also made out of aluminum ore. And then we can slowly start getting rid of all the extra pickle mealed farms. Next up is the new barracks. And unfortunately, some people are going to end up in the stargazer room. Some people are going to end up in the normal barracks. They can draw straws. It's not a big deal. When clay gives us more drops, we'll make sure we add more different barracks types. And the temperature is actually decent here. So I think we're going to be able to throw in some mirth leaf. Oh no, we're not using mirth leaf. It all takes metal ore. Sorry, no hanging flower pots for you. But the best part of a new barrack system is whenever they wake up, the first thing they have to do is go right through our beautiful new nature reserve and get smacked right in the face with a plus six morale. Look at this. Sulfur just woke up and is already sitting at a 23 morale. This is much improved from where we just were. And all we did is put a little channel that forces dupes this way. And this will be a great spot for maybe some future statues or artifacts that we find on our space missions. One little side note. Did you know you can build the park sign out of just about anything? We went with granite for the plus 20% decor. And unfortunately, our smooth hatch is eaten just about all of the aluminum ore. They have about 500 kilos left that we're going to leave there because we don't want the smooth hatch to, you know, starve. And we'll also eventually need regular aluminum anyways. But while we had enough aluminum because of that to put in three auto sweepers and a couple of conveyor loaders, we certainly don't have enough conveyor rail to link these up to our primary line. Now there is some other metals around here. For instance, this is uranium. We have some aluminum here that we're about to grab. There's some iron ore here, but we desperately need to save that because it's our only possibility for getting steel. And then there's some wolframite in here. Now, normally we save wolframite to turn into tungsten, so we can eventually turn that into thermium. But there's also a little bit of cobalt ore still stuck in this cave. It's going to require a little bit of digging, though. But because this is all carbon dioxide and the dupes are going to get sopping wet, it's going to take us a little while to get to. But once we do, this will be a couple of tons worth of cobalt. It also has the added advantage of continuing our long-term plan, which will then lead to us eventually putting a little system here that brings all the salt water up here. But until we get suits, we're not going to be able to deal with it. And during this whole time, we've actually unlocked another colony achievement. I'm not 100% sure on what it could be. Let's find out together. Finely tuned machine. Perform 100 tune-ups on power generators. And thank goodness we did, because I'm pretty sure one of the reasons we've been successful so far is because of this system here. Having the NGs tune-up and freeing up that much hydrogen has pretty much powered this entire colony for about 100 cycles, I'm guessing. Well, that worked out pretty well, and we're back up to 6.4 tons worth of cobalt ore. Let's blow some of it, shall we? And unfortunately, we're going to be running that rail right through those natural tiles, which is going to get rid of them. Not a big deal, but we normally try to keep the rails outside of the stable. Because while that egg is traveling in the stable, those critters are no longer producing. In this case, the eggs go from the conveyor loader to outside the stable fairly quickly. So it's not a big deal. And with the stable complete, 
the branches are now grown up enough, we can transfer these pips right on over. And with the squirrel cats comfortable in their home, it's time to reclaim all this area. Additionally, we're up to 181,000 calories worth of pickled meal. And I don't want to destroy too many of these planter boxes, because I'm not sure how much the dupes are eating barbecue and how much they're eating pickled meal at this point. The only thing that is for sure is we're making too much pickled meal. It also means we're going to get to reclaim all these materials. I mean, doesn't that look a lot better? I don't know what we're going to do with that space, but considering how small this planetoid is, eventually it's going to come in handy. Ooh, we unlocked another achievement too. And once again, I have no idea what it is. Ghost of Gravitas. Pretty sure we did that a while ago. Recover a database entry by inspecting facility ruins. Oh, uh, it's because I opened this security door. And I did it because I was draining all the salt water down here. Which, by the way, it's time to put it down another liquid pump. And I never really noticed, but the liquid pumps? Very expensive, at 400 kilos. And there is absolutely no way that I have enough metals to run a conductive wire all the way down here. I might have enough to run it right through here, though. And look what else we found. I wish we would have unearthed it a long time ago, but there was another beta hive down here, and we didn't discover it until we dug down. It was in the very, very corner of the map. But this is even better news, because as these bees start to core out all this area, these bees have been busy doing this side, and we're already up to over a ton of enriched uranium. That's long enough to run a nuclear reactor for 100 cycles, and there's plenty more where that came from. I put a little wall here, and that way we may be able to get power through. And although we do have conductive wire really close, we still don't have that much refined materials. But we can put a nice manual generator and jumbo battery right here. And then just use two-strand wire. This is still going to be ridiculously expensive. There we go. Now eventually all this water is going to be drained. Which will of course clear up all this area for who knows what. But that leads into the last system I wanted to show you today that I thought you'd be interested in seeing. If you remember from a few episodes ago, the end state of this system was that the brine was going to cool down the salt water, which was going to also heat up the brine. And that served us two purposes. One keeping the water temperature regulated, but also ensuring that the brine water going into the salinator was warm enough to where it just didn't flash the pipes as soon as it converted to regular water. So we've put a simple little automation system in. We have a thermo sensor here set on above two degrees. And what happens, as long as this tank is above two degrees, this pump will turn on and the saltwater tank pump will turn off. In effect, it just allows there more and more salt water to sit here exchanging its temperature with the brine until it slowly heats up enough to be used in the desalinator. Now this system is by no means perfect, but it's free. And what I mean by that is we eventually could just put a wonderful liquid tepidizer in here and keep the brine exactly where we want it. And we could also cool down the salt water by using a thermo aqua tuner or something like that and set its temperature where we want it to. But for now, without having to pay all those materials and that power cost, this works perfect enough. We've gotten a lot accomplished in this episode from our new cot and nature reserve system. We've also managed to overcompensate for the starvation messages and have gotten food sort of straightened. We have 14,000 calories worth of barbecue and 180,000 calories worth of pickled meal. Which this brings up another problem that we're going to be facing in the future. We only have 130 tons worth of igneous rock. And as you can see, there's not a whole lot left on this planetoid. Now we have over 400 tons of granite, so we eventually can flip the stone hatches over to that, but I'd prefer not to. But this may also push us to either go over to the next planetoid or start accelerating towards our space program so we can go pick up some more igneous rock whenever we'd like. I'm not sure. And quite frankly, the direction of the colony is sort of up for grabs. So let me know not only what you thought of this episode, but also what direction you think we should be heading in. Until next time, happy gaming, and I'll talk to you soon.